Okay, this, in this video we're going to derive the five equations of motion. The five equations of motion are equations that give us a general relationship between initial velocity, final velocity, time, displacement, and acceleration. There are five equations and that means in five variables, so we will elim eliminate one of the variables in each of the equations. Uh, to do that, we're going to start with a velocity time graph. And I'm going to keep things fairly general so that these equations will apply to as many different situations as possible. However, I do need to make one stipulation or one requirement of these equations. You'll notice that the graph is a straight line. which means uniform acceleration. Oh, that's a funny M. This means that once these equations are derived, you will only be able to use them for situations that have a constant or a uniform acceleration. If the acceleration changes, these equations will not apply. So in general, what we're going to do is we're going to call the final time t. We're going to assume we started from zero. We're going to call the final velocity v2 and the initial velocity v1. And with those, we can start developing equations. The first equation, and we gave this in a previous uh, lesson as the definition of acceleration, but recognizes that acceleration is the slope of a velocity time graph. So, if we say that acceleration is equal to slope, then we can say that's equal to y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. Acceleration is equal to, or y2 is v2, that's our final y value, minus our initial y value, v1, divided by t minus 0. And we can simply write that, that acceleration is equal to v2 minus v1 over time. And this is the first of our five equations of motion. For our second of the five equations of motion, we'll recognize that displacement is the area under the curve of this velocity time graph. To do this, I'm going to divide this into two regions. <coughs> I'll um, call this A1 and this A2. And then I'll recognize the total area, which is equal to the displacement is equal to the sum of a1 plus the sum of a2. a1 is a tri or is a rectangle, length times width, and a2 is a triangle, base times height, divided by 2. A rectangle has a length of t and a width of v1. Our um, triangle has a base of time and a height, which is a little harder to see. It's right here. But we can see that the top value is v2, and that would be all the way from here to here. So if we only want from here to here, then we have to subtract away v1. We have to subtract away this v1 section. So it is v2 minus v1, and that's all divided by t2. 
Now with that in mind, I'm going to switch over to black here as we just do a little bit of algebra to simplify this into the uh, way that you'll typically see it in a textbook. V1t plus V2t minus V1t all over 2. I'm going to put this V1 over 2 as well so that I can add with a common denominator. And then I'll collect like terms. Moving the minus V1 T all the way up here. You have two of these V1Ts, you lose one of these V1Ts, so that is just a single V1T that's left over. And finally, they factor out the T. These should all have arrows. Anyways, you get the idea, they all have arrows. So with that in mind, here is our second equation of motion. Now that we have two equations, we can uh, determine all the other equations algebraically. So with that in mind, I can take those two equations and forgetting this graph entirely at this point, I can um, just use elimination and substitution. Oh, why isn't this working? I can just use, um, I don't know why it's not erasing, I'll just come down here, that's fine. Uh, I can use algebra to solve those, um, solve the, to find the other ones. If I recall, my first equation of motion was that acceleration is equal to V2 minus V1 over T. And so, um, recognizing that T does not equal zero is not an interesting solution. I can play a little uh, algebraic trick with these two equations and multiply them together. So on the left hand side I'll get A times delta D and on the right hand side I'll get V2 minus V1 uh, over T times V1 plus V2 over 2 times T little arrows here And what I can see here is that I have a time on the top and I have a time on the bottom. So those two can cancel out. Again, note I said this is, we're not interested in solutions where t is equal to zero. So we're, that's not a realistic possibility. And then I'll get v2 minus v1. v1 plus v2 over 2. And um, I'm going to multiply. I'm actually going to bring the 2 up to the other side. So that eliminates that 2 right there. And then on this side I'm just going to multiply out. This is a difference of squares. So V2 squared minus V1 squared. You can foil out that binomial and check that that's true yourself. But what we have here is the third equation of motion. So that's 3 of 5. Um, again I can just use algebra to get any of the other ones I'm missing. So, um, what I've got here is I've got an equation that has no displacement. That's this equation. I've got an equation here that has no acceleration. That's this equation. Now I have an equation that has no time. That's this equation. So, what I'm missing is an equation that uh, doesn't have V1, an equation that doesn't have V2. I'm going to do the equation that doesn't have v1 algebraically. One more time, I'll just practice using substitution. 
And then I'm going to do the equation that doesn't have v2 by going back up to the graph and thinking about it in a different way. So for the one that doesn't have v1, again, if I start with two of my known equations of motion, a, a equals v2 minus v1 over t, and delta d equals v1 plus v2 divided by 2 over t. You can kind of think about this as some sort of common sense, right? Because this term sort of represents the average velocity. So we drove that, we came up with that equation based on the graph, but if you just look at it, I think it, it makes sense. So the average velocity times time gives you that distance. Anyway, um, I'm going to eliminate v2 here. So I'll solve this equation for v2, bring the t up by multiplying both sides by t. And then um, by adding v1 to both sides, I'll move the v1. And there it is. Now I can take that and substitute it into my displacement formula. Remember, these are all vector, 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 vector. Anyways, my displacement formula, um, v1 plus v2 over 2 times t by rewriting the v2 with what I know v2 is equal to in that equation. v1 plus um, a t plus v1 over 2. And then I can simplify what's in here. I have two v1s plus a t over 2 times t. And I can take this 2 and this 2 and cancel them out and just call that front part v1 plus a over 2 a t over 2. And that's still all multiplied by t. And finally, I can write, I can uh, put the t into the brackets. And after all that work, we get what I think you will see in most textbooks is the fourth equation of motion. So we've got 1, 2, 3, 4. The fifth one can be gotten the exact same way I got the fourth one, so I'm not going to write it out. I'm just going to give you the answer. Five. The fifth equation motion says that the displacement is equal to the final velocity times time minus a t squared over two. So it's just like the last one, but with a minus. It has v two in it. So there you go. And uh, just one more one more thing here. I'm going to come back to the graph and. Just for the sake of argument, I'm going to rederive this equation. I'm going to find this one again, just in a different way. And I just want to—I don't know—I just want to show you another way to think about the graph. See if this is going to erase now. Oh, good, it's working. Oh, I didn't want to erase. That's okay. Put that back on. So here's my graph, and I have my final velocity, my initial velocity, and my time. I said initially that the displacement, delta d, is equal to the area total under the curve. And I said before that that can be made up of a, a green area and a red area. I don't know if I'm consistent with what I did there last time. I can't remember. Anyways, the red area for this derivation is going to end up being the same. Length times width. And the green area is still, is still a triangle, so it's going to follow the same basic formula. But how we deal with that formula is going to be slightly different. So in the initial square, I have a length still of t. And I have a width still of v1. In the final triangle, I still have a, a base of t, 
it's the height that I'm going to play with. I'm going to divide that by 2. Now if you go back in this video, you're going to see that before I referred to this section as V2 minus V1. Which is true. If you imagine this is V2 and this is V1, if you take V2 and you subtract away the V1 part, I think you can see how that's the case. But it's not the only way to get that section. If we recognize that this slope, rise over run, is equal to the acceleration, and then the rise is the part we want. That's our rise. So rise is equal to our slope, acceleration, times our run. And in this case, our run is t. Or if I move over this far, I'm going to go up an acceleration or a slope times this high. So I'm using the fact that I take this many steps over, this is how much it's going to increase. And instead I can view the rise, or this section of the graph, as acceleration times time. With that in hand, I can say that the height of that triangle is acceleration times time. So V1t plus at squared over 2. And this is nothing new. This is a, this is a repeat. But it's just a different way of looking at where equation number 4 came from. I guess alternatively you could um, use the same sort of argument to re-derive equation 5. But I, I mean I just wanted to show you a slightly different way of looking at it. We're going to in future videos use these equations to solve problems without bothering to make the graph uh, but just to use the relationships we've developed here.